All right, well, good morning, everybody. I just want to introduce myself. My name is Dustin Perkle. I am the assigner for Lola. I was appointed by the board in uh, September to be your new assigner. Um, I just want to give you a little bit of information about Lola. Um, we are gathering, training, certifying, and disciplining all of the officials in Lola. Okay, so it doesn't necessarily mean we're going to have a disciplinary issue, but if something arises, Lola is going to be the disciplinary um, force behind that. Um, what we do is we service all of Louisiana. We service teams in Jackson, Mississippi, um, all along the Gulf Coast of Mississippi, all the way to Daphne, Alabama. So we cover a pretty large area, and number of officials is rather thin. But I think we have just enough to cover everything that we need to cover. Um, we also observe a hierarchy of college, college club, high school, and youth. And what that means is basically, as an official, if you get assigned a high school game and you do college uh, lacrosse as well, and you get a game from your college assigner, well, you're going to turn back the high school game and you're going to do your college game. Kind of the same thing with youth. If you're assigned a youth game, and you get an assignment from me for a high school game, you're expected to turn down the, the youth game and do the high school game as well. We do not tell you how many different associations that you can work for, um, but as long as you're working for Lola, that needs to be the, your, your priority. Um, I know that there are some officials in the South that work for different associations, Gulf Coast, um, they do youth as well, um, but just understand that we're not telling anybody in our association that you have to only work for Lola. Okay, you can work for any other association that you would like, okay? Just as long as Lola's gonna be priority. Um, you got anything to add on that? Just a couple things. Uh, so with, with him being more local, obviously you got an issue call, call really anybody on the board, but that's Dustin's role. Text him, call him, email him. And if there's some issues with conflicts with games, uh, just get a hold of him and let him let him try to do his magic and work it out. So, but if you're not communicating, uh, you're not going to have a lot of success, and that's when we have problems. So, good lines of open communication. Also, post game, if there's an issue, we within our association you report to the president. So the president of the high school league and the uh, president of uh, the officials can have conversations of what to do. But it's good to let the assigner know if there's been some issues going on with the game, okay? So that he knows, okay, I got an issue, and maybe I need to shuffle referees or whatever to, to make things happen, okay? But it's good for him to hear it also. Uh, we do it if you're the R, just make sure you put it in the game before when anything pops up. But if you have something unusual, especially an ejection, we need to let the president know. It's also a good idea to test them. So Dustin already has been much more proactive because it's just here uh, than what we've seen in the past. So do it. Just challenge him to help you help him. Okay. Any questions? As, right. as far as the assigning goes, I'm going to just talk about the assigning for oh, a little yeah. bit. Um, <clears throat> I'd like for you to accept your games within 48 hours. Okay. Um, I pretty much have a lot of the season scheduled already. Um, I just haven't published anything. So. Probably within the next week or two, I'm going to be sending you guys a bunch of games because I've, I've already scheduled at least half the season already. Um, that being said, once you accept your games and when those, that, those weeks come to where you, your games are going to be starting, get together with your crew. I, when I say get together, just kind of communicate with your crew probably within three days before the game just to make sure that everybody's on the same page, okay, and make sure we get the uniforms uh, synced and where we're going to meet what time, you know, all the, the logistics sorted out. Also for R's, if you were assigned as the R for the game, I want you to be contacting the head coach of the home team just to make sure that those games are going to be played at the place where they say that they're going to be played. I've contacted everybody that I need to contact, and I got the sites pretty much fixed in the orbiter. It was a little scrambly. Um, I kind of cleaned it up a little bit. So if there's a location on the orbiter that's not correct, just let me know and I'll go ahead and fix that. But for pretty much all of the teams here in Shreveport, all of the home games and the sites should be legit. Just, but just make sure, just to make sure that nothing's changed, the time hasn't changed, or 
just anything. It's just good to communicate with the coach. They like to hear those phone calls just to see that you are taking initiative to, to do a good job and be professional about it, okay? And if there's any problem? There may be a game or two here or there where there's a combo JV varsity where I have one guy doing the referee as a JV and then he's going to be an umpire on the varsity. So in that case, like I said, just make the R for the varsity game the one who's going to do all the communicating. And it's not useful just for game times and, you know, especially when you start having weather conditions and things like that. But there's also the special event, Senior Day, and, you know, how are we going to do that? Halftime a little longer. Now we're going to do a pregame. You can get all that stuff worked out ahead of time so sure. that you take care of it in your pregame. Everybody knows when you walk on the field and when you talk to the visiting coach, Probably the head coach has already talked to, the home coach has probably already talked to him, but it makes just everything, everybody's on the same sheet at the start of the game. Okay. Um, continuing on, uh, just go in the orbiter and look at your blocks because uh, I want to make sure that I don't assign you to any games that you have blocked out. So, um, And then finally, if you have not paid your dues, I'm not gonna have to. I'm not gonna be able to assign you any games. So if you haven't paid your dues, I need you to pay your your Lola dues. Um, and I think that's about it. Oh, um, there are three dates that I want to discuss with you guys that we're gonna have some in-season trainings. Um, it's all on Monday nights, but I don't think that there are any Monday night games throughout the entire season. I want to say that the first one is on February 18th, and March 11th, and April 1st. Okay, so those are going to be three dates where you guys, you, you officials are going to have to get together some sort of way and have an in-season training. And we're going to have a choreographed meeting where what's happening up here is going to be the same thing that's happening uh, down south, Baton Rouge, Lafayette, New Orleans, just to make sure that we're all on the same page about everything, okay? Uh, does anybody have any questions about the orbiter? Does anybody have any questions about getting logged in? Everybody's good with the orbiter? Okay. Well, if there's anything I can do to help throughout the course of the season, please do not hesitate to contact me. And thank you for your time. All right. Uh, for those that don't know me, Steve Luxie and Lux. I've uh, been doing this for a bunch of years, but um, I'm the head referee. So where I usually come in, and if we have an issue uh, or you have an interpretation question, uh, it's usually good to run those through me. Okay. Send me the question, give me as much detail about what the situation is, call what you call in the game. When you get done, go check the rule book. If you're wrong, let the coaches know that you made a mistake and this is, you know, what should have, this is what I called, this is what I should have called. And move on, right? We, nobody's perfect, no problem. Um, but if there's an interpretation, you're not quite sure, you get weird situations, we have that happen all the freaking time. And I can answer it, I'll answer it. Otherwise, I will start forwarding up the chain. And we've had, because we start our season so much earlier than the nation, you know, think up north, they don't really get going until April. Uh, a lot of things are discovered down here in the south, and, and it goes all the way to NFHS. There's probably been about three or four issues over the last two years that I've been doing this, a year and a half, two years that have gone all the way to the head of the NFHS Rules Committee to figure out how they want to interpret a rule found here. So, so don't be shy about that. And we'll get the word out. We'll try to, as an association, referee it a certain way across the association until I get a word from NFHS how they want to do it. Okay? Kind of started with the, the warding off uh, bull dodge thing. Uh, I think that was about a year ago was, was one example of that. But it's been things like uniforms and all kinds of stuff. Lex, will you be the uh, mechanics go-to guy as well? Yes. Yep. Uh, now, Dustin's a trainer. You know, Brian Landry has a lot of experience. You know, you can always talk amongst yourselves to do it. But if you if you have issues that you you want to forward to me, then uh, please do. And we're going to talk some mechanics today, also. Okay. All right. The new rules uh, interpretation. What the way we're going to cover things today given time and then then for the coaches so you guys know and you can decide when you want to leave got the video it's very fast uh, kind of covers all the issues I have a PowerPoint slide presentation right behind it that we can talk in much more detail about what this presents in the <coughs> rules and interpretations I may stop the video uh, at a couple places just so you can see the type of hits we're talking about especially with the new targeting rule 
uh, where you, you know somebody intentionally targets the head. Well, what's intentional, what's not? Bottom line is all that one does is take away the, the two minute locked in option and you can only go with three minutes. The idea there was to, to take away the option on all these shots that are really violent in the head to a three minute lock in uh, possible ejection. Kind of get that, get all officials, especially some of our younger officials, all on the same sheet of music of how, how important concussions and how serious they, they are. One thing I would like to add to it is there was a study, I think it was done at Brown University last season uh, with the players. And even in non-concussive situations, hits, just normal lacrosse play, uh, things that came out underneath what a, a concussion protocol found, they found out that, uh, that their players had a degraded, degraded capability to do you know, math and you know, complex and simple type of problems. So concussions are real, take them seriously. Who watched the bowl games this season? How many guys did you see get thrown out for concussion, for targeting? It's happening. It should happen in our sport too. Don't be afraid to chuck a kid. He's out for that game. He learns, everybody learns to stay away from those hits up in the head, okay? We don't want to have to throw a kid, but we will. Is that ejection like other ejections where he also misses the following game, or is it just Yeah, like no, it, it's, uh, well, it's, uh, yeah, it's an, it's an ejection. So until the league makes a decision on that, but that'll be exactly the same thing. And it's kind of same similar to how football is managing it, where they really want the guy out for an entire length of a game kind of thing. So if it happens in the first quarter, yeah, you could lose a kid for two, two games, but that there's no, there's been nothing discussed about changing the, the protocol for, for an ejection. So it behooves the coaches, everybody to, to work with the players to keep, keep, it, keep it down, okay? And we'll, you'll see the type of hits we're talking about in the video. After the video, slides, we'll talk in detail the rule changes. Then I have a, uh, about three sets of slides and mechanics, uh, game management, uh, and then also a, one specifically looking at targeting again. Uh, and then we have some, uh, depending on our time, some area around crease play, face-offs, pre-game administration type things. And then what we have found has been very, very valuable is I have a bunch of different flashcards with different kind of events that could occur as a penalty or would occur as a penalty. And we have you make the call actually reporting it to the, to the table so that we get it all in the practice of how we want to report, how we want to make it very clear. So everybody's doing the exact same thing, but as, as we go through these, you know, just beyond doing the right kind of hand signals, there's some of them are more complex with simultaneous fouls, dead ball, live ball, live ball, dead ball, how to, how to manage a penalty, okay? So that we've, we have found almost everybody is a little um, shy and surprised that, you know, when they actually have to get up here in front of everybody and do it, how it's a little bit harder than they would think it would be, okay? So that's the plan for today. All right, starting with the video. Twenty nineteen NFHS Boys Lacrosse Rules Interpretations. Presented by U.S. Lacrosse. The NFHS approved six new rules for the twenty nineteen season. This rule was added to address a potential situation at the end of a period or game. Now, when a shot is released before the end of a period and the horn sounds with the ball in midair, the goal will be disallowed if, after the horn, the ball contacts any member of the attacking team or if the ball is touched by a player on either team after deflecting off the goalkeeper or the goal. New language for targeting was added to more clearly defined penalties that should result in at least three minutes of penalty time and serious consideration for an ejection. Targeting is defined as intentionally taking aim at an opponent's head or neck and intentionally taking aim at a defenseless player to purposefully make violent contact. The NFHS and the Men's Official Development Task Force strongly encourages officials to throw flags for targeting 
and to discuss a possible ejection to deter players from making similar body checks in the future. This rule was added to encourage coaches to stay off the field during play and to give officials another option to penalize a coach that does not heed their instructions. If a coach steps onto the field and obstructs play, they may now receive a one, two, or three minute releasable unsportsmanlike conduct penalty. Officials still have the option of calling a technical foul for a coach being on the field who does not obstruct play and the potential to escalate multiple technical fouls for that same behavior to a releasable unsportsmanlike conduct foul. This rule was written to prevent a potentially dangerous play that could result in a shot released toward an unsuspecting and unprepared goalkeeper. Now, exchanging crosses while one player has possession of the ball during live play is illegal. Old language was deleted and a new article was added to this rule. In addition to the rules against warding off with one hand or arm, now a player with two hands on his cross is prohibited from using either hand or arm to push against the body of the defensive player. It is legal for an offensive player to keep two hands on his cross and contact a defender's cross to create space for his hands for a pass, shot, or other lacrosse move. Officials are reminded that a ball carrier who uses his helmet against the head or body of a defender to bowl his way past that defender is not warding off that player should be charged with a non-releasable personal foul for an illegal body check. The NFHS approved clarifications to the following rules. This rule was clarified to read that the head length should only be measured from the front face of the head. This rule was clarified to eliminate stringing techniques that could create an unfair advantage. This rule was reworded and now for a shot on goal to eliminate a stall warning, a shot can only be taken from parallel to or in front of the goal. The updated language also keeps a stall warning active if a goalkeeper deflects a pass coming from below goal line extended. This rule was updated to clarify the over and back call. The ball must touch the center line or something over the center line for an over and back violation to be called. Additionally, any player on a team's defensive half of the field is prohibited from reaching over the line to bat the ball with his foot or other body part, excluding his gloved hand wrapped around his cross. A player may reach his cross over the midline to bat the ball. No changes were made to the wording of these rules, but they were separated from the section on illegal body checks and turned into their own sections for greater clarity. The penalty for violating these rules is a two or three minute non-releasable foul at the official's discretion. An excessively violent violation of this rule may result in an ejection. This rule was reworded so that a coach or non-playing member of a team could be ejected from the game and receive a one-minute non-releasable unsportsmanlike conduct penalty instead of an automatic three-minute non-releasable penalty. The NFHS and Men's Officials Development Task Force believes this clarification will encourage officials to eject problem individuals from the game without automatically penalizing the players with a multi-minute penalty. These rules were rewritten to establish clear differences between legal and illegal holds. Now, if a player's hands are no wider than shoulder width apart, that player may use the handle of his cross to legally hold an opponent so long as that player uses equal pressure and does not use a thrusting motion.
previous language was removed so that this rule would more closely match how flag downs are officiated in high school and collegiate games. Now, officials will withhold their whistles on a flag down until one of seven situations occurs. Use the mnemonic goodies, G-O-O-D-I-E-S, to remember when the whistle should be blown. Goal, out of bounds, Offense commits a foul or violation. Defense gains possession. Injury in the scrimmage area. End of a period or game. Second defensive foul is committed. Thank you for watching the 2019 NFHS Boys Lacrosse Rules Interpretation video presented by US Lacrosse. Remember to stay ahead of the play and to take care of your crew. All right, so this rule is just put in place. We measure the sticks this way. This was done because a manufacturer had designed a stick that if you measured it from the back, it was legal, and they were fighting with that it should be put into the game, and they were overruled, so that's the purpose. So it has nothing to do with how we've done anything. It's always the same. <coughs> This is, uh, so if you're looking at the head of the stick, you know, there are sticks that have the extra holes so they can go out in versus the inside. Um, but you can see on this one, if you're looking towards the head of the stick, this picture is kind of weird, that, that gap, the ball doesn't have to all the, fit all the way through it. It just, if it's strong so it can ensnare the ball, giving an unfair advantage, then it's, it's an illegal stick. And it's a three minute, somebody's coming in. It's a three minute um, locked in penalty and the, and the stick is removed from the game. So beginning of the season referees, what I suggest you do is keep your eyes open, look around, try to, if there's any issues and then coaches just watch out for weird stringing techniques um, so that we don't have to get there. If you see it prior game, get it fixed. We don't want to have to call it, but if, it, if the kid does it and you, you, get, you see the stick, that's an illegal stick. Three minutes locked in. Okay, uh, more probably for our coaches, uh, coming is a new uh, chest protector for goalies. Uh, the situation, I forget what the, the proper medical term is for it, but when they get hit in the chest at a certain portion of the heartbeat can cause the heart to stop. We've actually lost some kids uh, with this, goalies. Because you have more players on the field, they've also had an equal number of players, field players have this happen. For 2021, they're going to uh, require the the uh, not new Noxy standard uh, ND 200. Recommend you get your goalies to get them now. They are available. Uh, they're also looking at requiring field players in, in the future. It's not in the rules, but they're thinking about a, a chest protector for field players because they have as equally as many people that have gone through this where their heart has stopped when they've been hit with the ball. Nothing when we need to do anything different as officials. It's not, we're not, not going to take off their pads and it's not until 2021 anyway. Okay, so let's talk about this. Behind the goal uh, for, so let's, let's consider, let's start off first. Any shot, anything that is thrown at the goal from even if you're at X, bounces off some knucklehead, you know, standing, looking forward, hits him in the head and bounces in the goal is a goal, okay? Just because we're defining this thing as a shot doesn't stop what's a goal. The ball that passes through the plane of the goal is a goal no matter how it gets there. As long as it's not been thrown, you know, there's probably rules, but it, you know, kicked, thrown, deflected, okay? This is put in place for uh, primarily it was established and it sits in the, the stall warning. So if we get a shot and when we talk about that it's not the player that has to be above goal line it's extended it's the head or where the ball is released. Uh, for it to be a valid shot it has to be above goal line extended. So valid then where we'd wave it off or what? Hits the goalie, goes in the goal, hits the goal pipe. Right? If it does that, then we wave off the, the stall warning. If that happens from behind the goal, 
we don't wave it off. You, you continue play. Also, some other considerations to think about. Anytime we have a shot from behind the goal, in general, is not going to be a shot. You know, they're shooting it out and the ball goes flying out to, out of the, well, in this case, let's, let's take the time. We've still got the, the delay on, so they have to stay in the box. As soon as that ball rolls across that line up there, let me see if I got a laser, for the box, it's now, right, what turns off the stall warning, or is, is the ball's turned over, the ball leaves that box area. So as soon as it comes out there, it, we're going the other way, right? It turns off the stall warning. They violated the stall warning. Are we clear on that? Yeah. Do we have a, uh, we have a, um, a philosophy for um, um, winning that? Right, so just like a goal, and waving off a goal, make sure you know it. If it's, if it's close to goal line extended, is that what you're talking about? Yeah. If it's close to goal line extended, is goal line, line extended? Call it a shot. Yeah, yeah. call it a shot. Yeah. We don't wanna, you don't want to take away opportunities for a good shot. But if he's, if, you know, he's clearly below goal line extended, uh, sticks in the right hand, he's on the right side of the goal, and he's, his body. So when in doubt, he's parallel. Right. Okay. Yep. I don't know if you had mentioned this, and correct me if I'm wrong, but your body can be below GLE. Yes. The head of the cross has to be above it in order for it to be considered. Or on, or on guard line is extended or above. Parallel so, or above. Yeah. Okay. So that means a side pipe hit is a white line. Yeah. If, okay. As long as it's perfectly on that line or assumed to be on that line. Which way it bounces. So. He's good. Don't be that good. <laughs> All right. And some other things to think about on that. Again, the shot goes out of bounds. If it was from below, it's not a shot. And if it goes flying out of bounds here, it doesn't matter who gets closest to the ball, right? It's not a shot. All right. So when you're installed. When you're installed. I would also apply that, is that really a shot when he's down there? I'm not going to call that a shot as an official, just generally when he's down below the ball. So that is a philosophy at all that would apply because there's, there's no realistic attempt to get that ball into the hole. Okay. All right, there's one missing, we'll cover that. So now we got a horn, okay? The end of the quarter. Ball's in the air, it's been released after the horn. So the horn sounded, whistles, we're choking the whistles, we're not blowing the whistles yet. Okay, it hits the goalie uh, and goes in, it's a goal, right? Just, and it's pretty obvious, just think of it hitting a stick and going in, it's, it's a goal. It hits an offensive player and goes in, no goal, correct? What's missing here is, before we get to hitting the goalie and deflecting, deflects off a defensive player and goes into a goal. What do we have? Goal. Goal. Good goal. If it hits the goalie, goal pipe, and hits any other player, any defensive, offensive uh, player, and goes in, no goal. Okay? So once it hits the goalie or the pipe and it deflects off of somebody else and goes into the goal, we wipe it off. So going through here, can go in, we got a goal, no goal. Uh, goalie, another player, no goal. But it has to go off, according to the rule book, read the words for me if you have them handy still. Never. It's disallowed if the ball is touched by a player of either team other than the goalie after it hits the goalkeeper, the pipes, or the goalie or his equipment. So what I it was... Goaltender in, score. That's right. So if it hits the pipe, goaltender in, score. Okay, we're looking at targeting. We're going to have this. This will go pretty quickly, except for discussion. We're open to discussion, but just to kind of get everybody on this new... And it's a new section in the rule book specifically discussing targeting. It's, um, and it says, uh, let me see, make sure. Intentionally make, taking aim, you know, again, you don't have to be that good. 
If, if it looks deliberate to you, you see a kid lining somebody up, somebody popping them, that's good enough. Remember, we want to be uh, over, overly conservative on especially hits to the head, okay? But the purpose is protecting the head and neck area, violent contact. And then the intentional thing is what you saw in a lot of those, the kid who's off the ball and the guy runs up behind him and pops him while the ball's moving around the other end. You know, obviously want that kid off the field. All right, so, you know, if it looks, you hear the ooh, the ah, from the stands and these big hits. These are the kind of things, of course, they're just still photos here, but these are the kind of things you need to be called. You got that head snapping, we're, we're looking at big concussions. The, the kids will adjust. We know that. We do it every single game. We try to be consistent. But every game's different, and we know we, we officiate every game slightly different, allow more, allow a little less, and the kids adjust. What we're trying to do is get them adjust between games and all games of, of getting away from this. So that's still a flag down, football still plays, right? Yeah, well, probably, probably when this kid goes down, he's so injured, we're going to whistle it dead. But if he doesn't go down, or he gets up and he yeah, it's still, it would then be. So let's say he's still going. Um, as an official, I would say, you saw, I do this too. It's more obvious usually to me when they take a shot in the head, I talk to them. You know, are you okay? What's your name? You know, something like that, making sure we're not already having a concussion. If his question was, the kid doesn't go down, what do you do? Do you stop it? I probably don't unless I see him wobbling around and showing something. Well, it's going to get to be weird for us this year because last year he was probably going to lose the ball. Yeah. The ball went out, you blow the whistle. Right. Now the ball's out. It, it, you just had a big crowd yell. It, yeah, and right. It, I have, and more than likely, more than likely he is injured mm -hmm. and we're going to blow it You might even be able to blow it and say, look, I stopped to check the guy. I thought right. he might be hurt. Or right. right. Or, 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 I'm feared for the guy. Again, we just saw a big hit. You probably... You, you could call it dead. I'll leave it to you to decide when not. I think it'd be rare, but it, you're in theory feasible that he could continue on. You know, especially a glancing blow where the kid really pops off him and he, he just falls off. He's ready to keep going again, you know, or whatever. But you're on the side of the players. Right. If I see, if he's on the ground, probably he. It's his team with the ball, so I'm not disadvantaging the other team. I'm probably blowing it dead because I. I got a kid who's just rolled three or four times across the field. So. Okay, there's that head to head contact. All right. Any head to head contact doesn't necessarily, there's incidental head to head contact that we just talked about. You know, they're driving, both kids are bumping heads. You know the difference between that and then, you know, this or a kid coming in leaning. I've even seen them leave their feet. You know, with the football tackle, kind of, because they don't want to wrap their arms, their arms are back. Um, that's, that's different. Three minutes, non-releasable foul, discuss, discuss ejection. Do not be afraid to eject. Okay, let's see if we got one here. Okay, yeah, this is the one I talked about earlier. Tw watch 24 white and 13 red. Let it go through once or twice. What do we have? It's legal. It's okay. legal. Okay. Defenseless. Legal. Uh, well, so so okay. Now let's let's take his defenseless situation. So he's he's working for the ball. He doesn't see the kid, but it's not really a a, a a violent hit. It's a it's a push. He's on his side. It's legal. He doesn't do. You know, take two or three steps into him. If he takes two or three steps into him, absolutely, it's a defenseless player, and we're there. But this, he's standing right with him, and he's pushing him off the ball. I'm okay with that. It's, it's, like that. it's not like you're not expecting a little bit of contact in the middle of a scrum. Right, and it, and it, again, it was a push. It's not a hit. A hit is also more impacting, right? More sudden and jolting. It's a legal push. That's the definition of handball right there. Yeah. That's what he gets for trying to break the ball. Right. <laughs> okay, so we're generally okay with this. Just making sure we're kind of all on the same sheet. 14, here's that hit again. This one is a defined hand in the air. Whoa. It makes it look worse. 
Play hit, one minute. What's that? I think it's late. It looks like he's in the ribs. One minute. Okay, so let's start with that. So if you use that one minute, uh, is there lesser contact you would still give one minute to? On a similar kind of hit. Uh, you know, either late or harder or softer. My point being, it can be, you can use the scale one minute, two minute, three minute, whatever works for you. Just leave yourself room for something that is not, watch his head. I don't know that they hit, but watch, see the shock in the head, the big head and it knocks down. So I got that hit versus a guy who just comes in, you know, well after the shot, hits them. They're still standing, but he hits them. Yeah, to me, that gives me my one minute range. Two minute is either more violent, something more off ball is kind of how I think about that. Three is a combination usually is I think scale. I'm not saying you're wrong. If you want to do one minute, now your crew, right? We want consistency now in this game. You guys need to talk about it and you need to stay consistent throughout the game, right? With what that level of that call is for that day. Drive coaches nuts when we start changing it. Now, you're in a game that's getting rougher. What I do is I meet the coaches in the box, say, hey coaches, I need your help. This game's getting rough. Talk to your players. We're gonna call it tighter. So they can tell their players too, expect us to start calling the game tighter. We thought they were gonna be big boys. We, we've, we've obviously been calling the game a little too light or the teams are getting too, too aggressive. You know, ultimately what we wanna do is not be seen, right? We want the kids to play it out and especially in that third, fourth quarter. But sometimes you have to make the call and my recommendation game management is you, when you do that, once your crew decides that's how we wanna go, you, if you're gonna make a significant change, you talk to the coaches. Pull them both into the box. Let them know what you're gonna do. Can I add more scenarios to you on this one? Okay, this is first quarter, zero, zero. Yeah. You call. Right, that's... So that, I mean, now, now, it's, now it's fourth quarter, six to five. That, you call so that's a good point. So what, what, do we, what are we supposed to do? And it's been a clean game. Six right. to five has been a clean game outside. So that's different. So now we have context. So I'll take this and again, we want context across the whole game, but given the, the time frames, this happens on the first time down the field and hit, I, I would have definitely called a two minute on this, okay, for me. Um, I don't know if there's helmet to helmet contact. If there is, he's locked, but I, I'd go two minutes. In the end of a game, it's been clean, there's a hit. Um, I'm probably still at two, but you're I think your point is valid and, and up for good discussion with the referees. If I haven't called this anywhere else during the game, well, only non-releasable if we had any kind of head contact. Um, there's been nothing that has happened in the game. There's been clean kits, and this, this happens a little late. Is it possibly down to a minute? I'm open to a discussion with my crew. I'm still probably leading with the two, just because that head snapped so much. If it was just a little less, more on the borderline of that one to two initially, I could potentially go the two early in the game and one, again, separate games, a clean game at the end, but this is sending a signal. You, don't, you do not call this. Whatever you call here establishes what you're gonna do for the game, right? That first personal foul is key. That sets the level. We have a ticky-tack slash We've established that ticky-tack slash for the whole game, and that drives us freaking crazy, drives everybody crazy, but we have to stay, we want to stay consistent. The kids adjust, coaches work with the players, they know it, they may not, they may complain about it, but everybody knows that's what we're calling that day. So you wanna get the call generally right, and then as a crew figure out, okay, was that a little high, a little low? That's where we are today, crew chiefs. Because you all know if this happens in the first quarter, it's only going to get worse. Right. Mm -hmm. so, That's right. I mean, I would, I, my thought is you better call it hard. First of well, all, if we were looking at the slides that we were looking at before, this is one of the particular slides that they clearly said was a player in a defenseless state. Okay, so when we have a oh, yeah, switch where we make a defenseless player call, it's an automatic two, two minute non releasable. Non releasable at the minimum. Okay, good so, point. This kid here, he's going to take a shot. He's still in a state where he's in a defenseless 
state. He's, he's maybe tiptoeing around the crease trying not to step in because he doesn't know where the ball is. Okay, so he hasn't had a chance to brace himself and protect himself for the contact. You can see here, he gets taken out and he has no idea he's getting hit. Okay, this at the minimum is a two minute non releasable. Right. So, legal body check to the fence. Let me, let me jump in here too. So, we have hopefully multiple flags down, but even with the flag down on these big hits, great opportunity to come together. We don't have to rush the call. So the expectation is, uh, so Justin just came in with Brian and I and goes, he was defenseless. Well, yeah, he was. And that, as soon as he said that, I'm like, oh yeah, that's exactly right. He was, in this case, he's defenseless. And we don't, it's a little clearer when it's a real game. That's why tapes are always hard to work with. But as soon as you said that, is you bet. I'm, I'm totally on board with you that this is a minimum two, uh, two minute nine releasable, and that's probably what I'm calling. And if it happened late, uh, late in the game, I'm stuck if it's, it's non-releasable. But we have that discussion. And that's what a good crew should do. It doesn't even have to be all players. It could be the two involved or the nearest. That kid goes down, where the flag is down, we've blown the whistle, play is stopped. Take time to talk about, and we talked about this yesterday, not the call, but what you saw. Right? Talk about what you saw from your perspective. That's why we have all these mechanics is so that different, we have different angles on things and we're looking at different things on the field. We spend a lot of time on mechanics. You bring to that discussion your unique view, express it. Express what you saw and then work together and form a consensus on the call if you can and then ultimately, if you can't, the R will determine what the final outcome is, okay? But that is, you know, boom, that's why I got another guy out there on the field because that's exactly the call, right? He, he, he nailed it. I, I got another. I've seen this play a lot of times. You know, you have the guy that's coming in and the shot's made. You see the guy pulling up. He kind of drops that stick and he slows down. And he's still bigger than the other kids. He yeah. Down. So, so, again, that's where your judgment comes in. If he's, if he's laying off and trying to avoid the hit, I, I'm probably got nothing. And then if the coach does, coach, he was stopping. He, you know, he, he, but he, but if he, if he still makes hard contact with them, you know, he needs to control his body a little bit too. So it can go either way. It's too much of a. I'm it, kind of trying to reward kids for pulling up, yep. but not calling it before. Yeah, right. It's, he has that much momentum and he can't stop, and he's 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 running from too far out. Yeah, that's right, and that's my point. Uh, yeah. But but you're right. If you see a kid lay up. You know, and, and, and really, for example, where I usually see this, and I, uh, and I won't call it, um, is the buddy, the buddy pass defenseless player. Kids running, doing. You see the defender, you know, coming up, but then realizing, oh, I can't hit this kid. And he kind of just, he's stopping. Kid comes down, they have contact. I'm okay with that. I mean, that's one of those... Yes, we had contact. Yes, he was defenseless in the air, but he has stopped. It's almost like the guy going up for the shot, and you know he's he's held his position. Now, if he gets up underneath him, and he, you know he's taken out his feet from under him, that's a little different. Then he's defenseless, and you've now impacted. You've had a hard hit because he's coming down awful hard, and you, you have, might have to still call it. Yeah, I definitely would want to call like a player two minute lockdown call. Up. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So that that's why you have a toolkit. You have a whole bunch of two, three non-releasable, releasable. Thirty seconds. There's things you can call thirty, and you'll hear this a lot as you proceed up through your refereeing things, you call the person, you call the big calls, right? You, you, the flag's up, you have to call it. But you game manage, you game manage through technical fouls. That's how you set the tone in a game. Or at least you want to. All right. <laughs> Again, we don't want to see that. I think we got a couple of flags on this one. <laughs> that being the most critical of all, who's got the count? Nobody wants to sit in line like that. <laughs> okay. 
One thing I want to tell you about uh, some of these um, non-releasable billings in this ejection, okay? Um, if you're not the R in the game, and umpire, field judge, whatever the case may be, younger official, veteran official, if you say that I feel that that kid needs to be ejected, and you bring that to your referee's attention, and the referee says we're not ejecting him, you go with the referee's decision, okay? But you bring that to my attention, you let me know, hey Dustin, I saw a play, I thought it was an ejectable foul, my referee overturned it, let me know, I'll get the game film, I'll check it out, and then if, if I feel that it was deemable an ejection, then maybe we'll have a little bit of counseling with the R that overturned your call. Okay, so don't feel like just because you're not the referee or just because you're not a veteran official that you can't make the ejection call. Um, but, you know, we want to make sure that we get it right. I, I would add, I would add one step before that, which is after the game, talk to the referee about yeah. why. Yeah, yeah so, talk to your referee about And you're not satisfied with that answer. Why didn't you yeah. eject this player? What was it that made you think that this was not and, ejected? And when you're having an ejection, it's okay to take time to have a discussion. Take the time on the field. And get back to what did each of you see? And then start discussing what the options are on calls and then move on. They, all be they always ought to be discussion before an ejection. And number two, if you're the official that threw the flag that's going to result in the ejection, you do not relate to the table. You rotate away. That's right. Always. Always. I mean, you always tell your, you communicate to the field first, even on a simple push, you know, what you, well, a push is pretty obvious, but yeah. you got to flag down. You're talking to your crew, not talking, you're signaling to your crew what it is I had, cross check, so that they can start doing stuff. If I'm gone, I'm going to eject the kid, you know, whoa. You know, we, we need to come together and, and come talk. together, and if you're the ejecting official, go to the far side. Right. And talk about it. A mechanics question. I've seen this in some of the US lacrosse webinars, the finer points with fishing. When you do need to come together, they often say the two that saw a good talk, the other third one watches because you got a big right. thing and should, somebody should always be officiating with players. Even if so that's that's a good point, and I'll have a slide on that. Let's always keep remember when the ball is dead, we come alive. That that's where we watched players crossing. Because that's where the stupid little fouls that can really set off a game can occur. But being present, eyes up, they see that you're looking. So in a, con in a conference, heads are up. Even when you're discussing between the two officials, you do not have to be looking face to face each other. You're both watching and the other official watching the other direction. If you go to three, just know that. Know that you got all three officials, you all need to be looking at different things and you can still have your conversation. One thing though, on the whole teamwork thing, again, what was your unique perspective? What did you see? Talk through it. You may have seen something that the other two didn't. Matter of fact, if you're trail, trail should definitely be seeing something different than the other two saw because he shouldn't be on the ball, right? He should be generally not on the ball. So he's watching something else, he catches something, he saw the kid running across for the hit from 20 yards out. That's important to add to the conversation. But have what you saw, discuss the options of the call, that's what I would recommend, where you think you come out on it, and when it's over, regardless, this is not the end of the world. This is not world peace. This is a, a decision in a lacrosse game to keep it moving on. Make the decision, everybody's in agreement, and we're moving on. The same thing that the R is probably going to have to tell the coaches because one coach is going to be happy, one coach is not. It was too much. It's too little. Got it. Here's what we saw, coach. This is what we had. Get some feedback. Understood, coach. We're moving on. And then and start the play again. Okay, they need, they, coaches need the conversation also. When we have those kind of stuff, especially an ejection, but even any big hit, do it. We have a situation, one other thing to consider, you ever have a situation where a kid is put down so hard, even with the, an, an ejection, and we have the ambulance arrive, it's usually a good time to pull the two coaches together and have a conversation with the two coaches, if not the two teams, of what you saw, 
and that you're just not going to put up with any kind of retaliatory stuff after that because that's the first thing a teenage kid starts thinking about okay coaches will do what they can we'll do what we can but let's make it clear to everybody this is bad players been ejected got it let's put that behind us let's play good lacrosse okay because right off the bat that's where the everybody all that emotion is going and that and they got a lot of emotion and remember the brains are not fully developed yet till about 25. Okay, over and back. And this is just really clarifying the rule. So the line is, it's already been touched in. The goal's down at this end, okay? So we're attacking, attacking down here. Ball's coming up. Obviously, that is not over and back. It hasn't touched the line. Ball touches the line or goes over the line or touches anything over the line. It's over and back. Play on, whistle is required. Okay, typically. Remember officials, every time you are where you were, so somebody goes airborne, um, they, they go before the line, let's say it's a sideline, you're airborne, ball hasn't touched anything on the sideline yet, sideline or beyond, ball's beyond the sideline, but you're airborne, ball's airborne, you slap it back in, you are where you were, you were on the field when you left the field. Okay, so that if he knocks it and it lands back in, doesn't touch the line, lands back in, we, we keep the play going, correct? So you are where you were. Anything on over and back? Okay, what they wanted to clarify with over and back is the ball coming up and a guy reaches across the line. He's a great soccer player. You brought him up from your soccer team. He kicks it. That's not, that, that's uh, over and back. The only thing they could do is obviously bat the ball like we've always done. He can't possess it because now he's on this side of the line and he's possessing the ball. He, can, he can't kick it. And if his hand is on the stick and he were, let's say, to punch it with the, with the gloved hand that is on the stick, then that's, that's okay. That's not over and back. So always the glove, just think about when we do checks. The glove is an extension of the stick. We don't let them beat on that like it's a stick. We puts it here, we, we coach, we teach, we allow checks on that hand as he's trying to pass and doing stuff with that hand on the stick. Okay. All right, now we're starting to look into the We've always known that the follow through is, uh, is the uh, not good. You see here with that, you'll see his elbow come up, it's pretty fast, but up into the head, we need to call those two, three minute uh, locked in penalties, illegal body check. Yeah, that's, what? Just like, that's fine. Yeah, that's He's not. Yeah. <laughs> it's fine as long as his arm doesn't go. Right. Yeah, you know, when his arm, well, also, wait, 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 coaches, coaches, coaches. Defenseless, you have a defenseless player also. His head is down. He's not expecting the hit. And, again, we're getting serious about these hits up around the head. So officials... We want to, in the player, you have a defenseless player, I would argue here, with his head down, and the guy follows through with the arm up into the head. So it's two to three minutes. And if you think he's intentionally trying to hit him in the head, then it's only three is the, is the lowest you can go with it. And this one, I would say no. This gift that they made is kind of fast. And if you've watched the original one, I've seen it, and the guy's helmet comes off. Yeah. On the full one. Yeah, they had the video of... On the video that we saw, yeah. they had it. Yeah, his helmet came final. Right. So, so this, so guys, this is we do not want to see this, and we want you to penalize it, flag it. Just to kind of emphasize on what Lux is talking about, the defenseless player hits, the targeting hits. Okay, this is all coming from U.S. Lacrosse. Uh, nationwide. This isn't something that Louisiana is making up. Okay, so U.S. Lacrosse wants us to be more aggressive on these types of calls. Not just Louisiana be more aggressive on these calls, but why. So we're going to do things as consistently as we can 
with the U.S. Across, which is the governing body of what we do. And, and it's really an NFHS rule. So, yeah. So we're, yeah, this is not our rule. This is an NFHS. They want us to be very aggressive with these calls, so that's how we're going to make them. And just something to expect in your game. So when, a, when an official makes this call, that's how these calls are going to be made nationwide. Okay. So defenseless player, uh, guy doesn't see the hit coming, and we get those big hits. Uh, buddy pass. Even if the guy catches the ball, lands, and he still gets wiped out, he doesn't have a chance to really defend himself. Or typically the ground ball, his head's down, he's looking. It is very difficult to get a legal hit anyway, but if he's defenseless and you wipe him out, you'll see, uh, I think I, in my, later I have another video of a player uh, where he's down getting the ball and the ball's scrumming around and there's a player standing in front of him and he gives him a legal push. That's okay. He's not lining them up, he's not hitting them, he did a legal push. So there is some room for you to you know, think about just because he's doing a ground ball doesn't mean he can't get a, a legal push. Enough to take him out of the play, not enough to take him out of the game. Right. So on the defenses player, the guy's down scooping the ball, he gets wiped out too aggressively. What's, what's the call? So a defenseless player, so it, let's just start with a pure just defenseless player. It's it's um, the call would be depending on where he hits him, but typically it's either an unnecessary roughness or illegal body check, defenseless player, and what are your options for defensive player? Non-releasable two, three, and consider ejection. Okay, anything that's defenseless, two, three, and consider ejection. If he targets the head or ends up hitting, let's say coming through on the follow through. You, it, you don't think it's a maliciously violent, like he's trying to hurt the kid, like you saw in those earlier ones. Behind a play, a kid coming behind him and popping him, that's at least three minutes. And in most of those cases, I'm ejecting the kid, right? Because there, no, there was intent to harm, right? To hurt. So uh, if he comes up, let's say he follows through and now catches the head, you know, now you really got to start thinking more towards the, you know, you're combining things, right? We got the defenseless player, we've now hit him in the head. Is he down on the ground? You know, ambulance rolling up. We, we're more towards the three minutes impossible ejection kind of thing. And then if you see that kid and it happens, and everybody on the field sees it happening, but you not necessarily can stop him, he lines somebody up, you see him coming. He's got a nice clean shot at that kid who's coming through the green valley. He's coming up and he's wiped out. There you go. I think we have a video of one like that on a face-off. That's, that's clearly a, uh, depending on where he hits him, he may not get a target. He may, he may catch him in the chest kind of legally, but uh, that's, it's illegal for defenseless player. Three minutes and it, the intent was to, to harm the kid, I'd probably throw him out. Okay. All right. Here's a, a pick. A, a pick, and he. I would argue with that call. Yeah. So he sees it. He's running. He sees it, and then he pops the kid with the cross check right to the right to the head. That is clearly a targeting penalty. That's three minutes non-releasable. Consider ejection. That's because he not because the stick was in the way, though, right? Well, stick to the neck. He hits him, he cross checks him right in the head. He, he, he hits him, but if he was just going like that, no. and he didn't see well, it. also looks like he's playing defense. No, so there's no, there's no way you can convince me he doesn't see the kid when he does this. Yeah, I mean, the move, the move right here. But right. If, he would, if he were to just play in defense and run into him, run that's a valid pick. But as soon as I see that elbow fly, we got something else. Got this one, this is, this in my mind is a clear targeting, three minutes, and very likely, and I, I would argue with my crew that we need to eject the kid. Okay, clearly dangerous, high. He saw it coming, and he made a, he made a conscious decision to pop him. I don't know. The whole team Okay, this one. Shots gone. Boom. <laughs> okay, that's again a defenseless player. Uh, he throws the elbow up in the head. We got targeting. If he stays down and hits him late, 
So think in your targeting, or not your targeting calls, let's think about a, a late hit after a shot. You're just your normal late hit, guy comes, gives him a little pop, you know, that's probably one minute, it's late. Puts the kid down, he's on the ground, pretty firmly on the ground, and it's legal, you know, side, front, late, maybe two minutes. You start doing anything else to it, or he's laid out and it's so hard that we gotta call out an ambulance, now we're out at three. And consider it, you guys have to, we don't know what's ever in the heart of anybody for sure, but consider what's going on in the game situation, what's happened before, and if this is a targeting, he's going after to, to harm him, the minimum would be three minutes and possible ejection. Okay, so to our coaches and to the way we, they want to manage it. We're not, we're not trying to get on a coach for his toe touching the line like you're watching a crease play. All right, that's not the intent. If, I mean, if the coach is in the way, for example, when I have the ground ball on the other side of him and his player is the, not the last to touch, the other team touches and I can't see it and then he gets mad at me, I'm like, coach, you're on the line. I can't, I, I made the best call I can. But they shouldn't interfere with your call. You got a full range of options. You got the conduct, 30, you can just talk to them, 30 seconds, or just a conduct call. Or you can now, if we have situations like this one on the end where he's out on the field, clearly, or let's say you're moving down the field and you get wiped out by a coach, or wipe out a coach because he's on the field, then you got the one, two, or three minutes unsportsmanlike conduct releasable. It's important to realize that's releasable because what happens when we get two non-releasables on a coach? He's ejected, right, or any player. He's ejected. So it just gives you more tools to deal with the coach. That coach that aggressively comes out there on the field at you. Coach, stay on the sideline. Or he comes out at you, throw the flag, take them 30, one, two, three as you need to. Okay, they want us managing the coaches. With the, the problem that's going on uh, with officials, uh, or US lacrosse, NFHS lacrosse, so we're losing officials primarily due to kind of that official abuse. Fan abuse, coach abuse, player abuse, and especially our younger officials are not being taught by our more senior officials how to manage coaches properly. We may be able to manage them through talking and everything else and, and getting the coach talked down. What they're saying, Brian, to folks and Eric, like us, is don't be shy about throwing the flag so that our more junior referees know how to do that and that it's appropriate with with coaches when they get out of line okay but you have the full gamut 30 one two three and it's it's releasable okay <laughs> okay we have ejections so what we probably will see with all these more emphasis on higher hits we probably will see an increase in injections just Beware, when it's a player, it has to be three minutes. When it's a coach, and I, I think many of our more senior officials are, understand this, when we are working with the coach, he's already had his first unsportsmanlike conduct, and he's still being a problem, and our only option is to eject him and penalize the team three minutes for coach's behavior when you're not trying to hurt the team you now have an option. You can go one, two, or three minutes. You can go all the way down the one. Idea is get rid of that coach quickly when you need to. It doesn't penalize the team. It helps send the message that that's not gonna continue, and we move on. And it doesn't hurt the team as bad because of coach behavior, all right? Assistant coach, whatever. Okay, that, and so specifically the wording of that ruling is non-player. So it can be a coach, assistant coach, somebody hanging around the table, you know, that kind of stuff. Especially in those kind of situations, help the coach out if it's not the head coach and we have a problem, you know, it's up to the coach to maintain those kind of people, but you're really kind of now helping the coach. We got rid of him and we haven't harmed his team as badly as we could have. Can you cover uh, a little bit on where an ejected player or an ejected coach yeah. is to go slide? Oops, oh, I guess maybe it is like, it is, but we'll just talk about it. So um, when it's a player, 
what we, the preference is if there's supervision, a parent, so you may need help from the coach uh, with this, is to escort him to the bus or off the, off the facility with, with the parent. If for some reason, let's say it's an away game, you have a, a coach and his assistant coach and that's it, you know, and not, there's no parents there to help out, then you put him at the end of the bench without his equipment on. Unfortunately, that sometimes is not good enough. Right now, we, we, hopefully the coach can now maintain the player and keep him where he needs to be, but that just provides a risk to all if we have him sitting on the bench and he starts mouthing off again. How do we deal with that? So the, the deal is with the player, if there's supervision, you know, stop the game, kids ejected, talk to the coach, figure out, how, you know, we need to get him removed from the bench and he needs to be supervised. We don't send him away unsupervised. And then if it's a coach, the coach has to leave the facility. Period. Okay. So coaches, and we've been training players for a long time, you know, drop that waist, your working body, right? So, and we as officials, in the purest sense, right, the way the rule book was written, that's between the hands, that could be a cross-check hold. We've never called it, right? Because we know it's not. That's how we're training our players to play. That's okay, we know that. So he's moving towards the goal. What I can't do is I can't start driving him out beyond equal pressure. I cannot, even with hands inside the, the shoulders, I can't pop him or I can't run into him and hit him this way. That's a cross check, right? So this is good. This is all fine. You know, within shoulder width, even that's fine. As long as I'm not driving him out. As soon as my hand gets beyond shoulder width apart and I gain an advantage, remember this is a technical foul if we're short of a cross check, I'm gaining an advantage on him as he's trying to move, go ahead and start trying to move. And I'm, you know, I'm using the thing to hold, it's a hold, right? I've got my arms apart. If they're in tight and he starts moving that way, it's more of a fair fight, right? So that's, and that's how we're teaching, you know, drop back, drop those hips, keep in there, okay? So, Nothing changes the way we call it until you see what we want to clarify, and you'll see this with the defenders with the bigger poles as they're coming out, that wider than hand, and it usually happens pretty quickly, that quick hold to stop momentum. That's a hold. Okay, shoulder, I don't have a D's pole, but if that thing's shoulder width apart, call it. Or, you know, he's fighting in, he's now an attackman, the goal's behind us, and we're kind of squaring up here it's equal pressure. Now what is equal pressure? He pushes me back a little bit, I push him back a little bit, that's okay. What you don't want to see is I'm now the six foot five guy just driving him out with him in between my stick. That's not acceptable. The, the, the defender's got a right to his little spot. And he, can, he can hold, you can't get run over and he can push back, but he can't just drive the guy into the corner. Right, right. And as long as I'm on his shoulder or his front, I do have, and he has the ball, I have legal push. push yes. I can push him here. What I can't do is he backs up to me now. You know, don't be that good that, okay, give a little, take a little. You know, we're here, we're here, we're, you know, that's give a little, take a little. But what I can't do is on his back do that, we have a push. But you can drive from the front and close. Right, you can. This is a legal, this is totally legal for me to push him all the way out, right? Because it's front or side, a legal push. All right, are we good? Do you guys understand that? Really, it's no change, and I'll probably use you again, okay. thanks. Um, there's no change to how we really officiate it other than be watching for those hands to start coming apart and the advantage, disadvantage. We have always been managing that as an advantage, disadvantage, and, and over time, that has become acceptable. And then since the, that is being taught, I think it was about three or four years ago for, for a, a few minutes, we went to trying to start calling that a hold and everybody went nuts, right? Because the coaches are teaching it, the players have learned it that way. So we're just trying to watch out for the, so we're defining advantage, disadvantage. Right? <laughs> Exchange of crosses. So what, was, what happened in a game, I think it was in Connecticut, and there's a tape of it, but it's really grainy, so that's why they didn't really put it in here, is, 
we can exchange crosses on the field, right? We, that's okay. What we can't do is we can't exchange a cross with a ball in it. So what happened was the pick guy like this and the attackman kind of met each other. So let me use you just real quick. I'm setting the pick. I have my stick the same way and they did a handoff. And the goalie, totally unexpected, take, you know, takes the shot. They don't want that. So that's illegal. Illegal procedure, you cannot do that, okay? Other things that I'll bring up with the officials that are is already the rule, what do we need for a restart? Everybody five yards. Everybody five yards. So when it's two offensive players, what we're really helping to prevent is the, uh, the illegal stick. Also watch behind the goal kind of thing. Sometimes it goes out on the right side, left side of the goal, and the, both guys pick it up. Uh, we're going to talk more about this later. You control the restarts. Whenever the ball, the only thing we control in the game, they really the kids control the game while it's in play, is when the ball's dead. That's the only time we get to control anything. So don't screw it up when we get a start and you got two kids with the ball and you know one kid drops one, picks up one, you know, boom. Okay, one zero has the ball. Show the ball. You know, of course everybody's freaking out. Get them started real quick. Restart. No, we want a fair restart. Okay, make sure it's fair. Not Sa only that, it's a safety issue on the goalie. If we have a restart at the X and the goalie's focusing on one player and then the other player has the ball and he takes a shot, that's, that's very unsafe to be taking a shot on a goalie who's unaware that a shot's coming towards him. So in the other situation tends to be with the goalie, right? Something around the crease. Ball, either the guy goes into the crease, touches it, uh, there's, a, there's a turnover with the crease and the D, D player's right there with him. There's no restart. There's no restart until that D man is five yards away. Okay, so wait for him. To just tell him to move away. Now, usually same team, no big issue. If it's the other team, start your count, right, for delay a game. Give them five. Don't you don't have to sit there and keep arguing with them. It's not five. Get the five. Throw the flag. Move the ball up field. Put them in the box. Okay, but. Just tell him that's not five, and then if he wants to take the delay of game penalty, take the delay of game. Okay? So we're good on no, no stick exchanges. Hasn't happened here that I know of, but it, it, apparently it caused havoc in Connecticut. All right, two hands on. Okay, this is the, let's go through, where's my big guy? We've got to have him with the ball since I'm the little defender. So wards. Uh, let me start, okay? Standard ward, uh, you're playing defense on me. Um, put stick in front of me. Standard ward is any kind of use, you know, of the arm here. He gets up under my sh arm here as I'm driving. Of course I'm allowed to clear my arm. You'll hear that call all the time, officials. Oh, it's a ward because they see the arm fly, right? That's not, a, that's not a ward. A ward is against the stick or body with one hand, okay? So any of that is a ward. So that's always been the same. Now we get to the whole two-hand thing. Okay, what is, let's start with what's legal. What is legal is, and you'll typically see it around the crease, around the goal, okay, not necessarily the crease. Mitty's driving, attackman's driving, we're working, he's holding me. I am allowed against the stick to, to do that, right? To get room, and what I'm doing is really creating shooting space. All right, as long as I'm not illegal into the body, or even, you know, he has a stick on me and I'm into the body. Okay, that is illegal. Dropping a shoulder into him and pushing it out, his body, is illegal. That's a ward. Now, we get the situation, I was going to have you run me over, but it could hurt me. <laughs> um, where the guy, your attack, your midi coming down the field, or your defender with little attackman comes running in is where we usually see it. And he comes in and he, boom, hits the kid and drives him to the ground. Okay, you have in your toolkit everything from a ward, if it's fairly soft, to uh, unnecessary roughness. One, two, three. And if we have this situation, now... You know, we're, we're working here and we get incidental head contact. Let's not get crazy, right? 
you know, if both heads, in, and we hear this too, we get contact as people are trying to play. Nobody's really initiating it. They're both hitting it. But if you think they're really going at it and both have done it, then you got simultaneous penalties that we could call, and we'll talk about that more later. But if you see him do the whole bam, that's spearing and targeting, right? He is going, especially if it's the head, against the head. If it's down here, it's spearing. And we need to go for normal type of a head type thing. It's, it's three minutes. If, it's, if you think it's intentional and violent, then it's three minutes possible ejection. You could go down to two minutes locked in three possible ejection. So you have the whole toolkit. Last year, we were allowing them to run over kids. Uh, that's, that was changed. They go, yeah, that wasn't, that wasn't a, good, a good thing to do. So are we clear that it's ward? I mean, that's a ward. That's not. This is. And then we can have, if I knock him on the ground or run him over, uh, we have the unnecessary reference. Yep. Okay, and then we can go beyond it if we start having headbutts and things like that in spear. All right? That should hopefully stop the, the bull dodges. Okay, ball on the ground. Flags down, we're working. Ball goes outside the box, we're working. You know, all that stuff that we used to do, worry about the ball hitting the ground, ball going out, doesn't apply. The only thing we stop for now, whistle, after that thing, it, uh, balls, uh, flags down, offensive still has the ball, is the ball goes to the goal, obviously, down here, end of the period or the game, whistle ends the game, or ball goes out of bounds. So something to think about. There's a shot, even a bounce shot, right? We don't care if it hits the ground or not. There's a bounce shot, and it doesn't go across the goal line, I mean the end line, we're still in play. There's nothing, there's no out of bounds, there's no we're stopping on a shot. It's a change of possession, or uh, the, it goes out of bounds, okay? Or they score. If the offense commits a second foul, this is a rule that's been added to the book. Remember last, last year and previous last two years, on a second flag in, a, in the box, in the last two minutes, we would stop it. Now, if the defense does two, two uh, infractions, two flag downs, then we, uh, if, the, if, if a goal scoring is not intimate, so let's say the second one is some kind of like slash as the guy's going to the goal and he get, takes the slash flag down but the, he's on the charge to the goal, we let that play out, right? We let, let that shot occur. As soon as that shot is over, blow the whistle and kill it. But otherwise, he's holding the guy, you know, he's goal line extended and he's holding him, holding him up. You throw the flag, he's still, go, you know, goal line extended, blow it dead, all right? Same thing if you have a, uh, an offensive injury, I mean offensive uh, penalty, that stops the play, right? Because we've had the defensive, offensive. So any other penalty stops basically the play. Just be careful with defense. The second, the second flag down, uh, if a shot is imminent, goal scoring is imminent, then you, you delay the whistle. Okay, the, the third one, the offensive commits a foul. If the offensive commits a technical foul for war, that just blows the whistle that kills the flag down. There's no time served. Right. Um, but if he commits a personal foul, the offense is going to go for one, two, or three. Mm -hmm. So we're dealing with simultaneous penalty at that point. And the second def defensive foul, again, if it's a personal foul, obviously he's going to serve time. But a technical foul, loose or with possession, right. he's going to serve 30 seconds. So this is important, right, guys? So let's say... Um, We've got the first flag down for whatever reason, right? And, and uh, I, I'm going, I'm the attackman, I drop the ball, defender's on my rear, we don't blow it because the ball's on the ground, right? We're gonna let it continue. I go to scoop, I get pushed. I get pushed, we blow it dead now, right? It's, it's dead play. Because we already have a flag down, that technical foul on a loose ball that would have normally been no serving, 
because I'm entitled to the ball, thinking in that terms, because my team is entitled to the ball, it's like possession. He serves 30 seconds plus the original penalty. So the proper mechanic throw your flag and blow the whistle? Yes. So yeah, the throw the flag. Obviously, scoring is not imminent, imminent in that situation. Blow the whistle, kill it, and both, both players serve. Or there's two penalties. It could be the same player, I guess. Good. The other one is injury in the scrimmage area. Let's talk a little bit about in injuries because this is always a bit contentious. Imagery, in, obviously, anytime we have somebody hurt and down around the play, get that thing blown dead, right? We, we kill it. Um, if it's a loose ball and it's away from them, wait, we want to try to get it up in the stick in possession if possible. I, I'm not talking about a flag down, a flag down here, you know, obviously denotes possession so we don't have to worry about it. Um, but it, the, the stoppage of play for an injury is associated with them being at risk, right? So they're either in the, uh, the area or there's, you know, the guy's down behind the play. If, if you assess it that it, it's not, you know, a life-threatening kind of situation and you have a fast break going, you can allow that fast break to go in. If you don't know, whistle it dead. Yes? I don't want to catch up. No, go ahead. So what he was saying was if it's a flag up situation, is a, a loose ball push, that's going to be like a 30 second push with possession. Mm -hmm. Right, yep, yeah, yep, yeah. for the defense. If the offense were to do it, it, it just kills it, right? Yep. Yeah. So you're going to have the one, you're going to have the one minute, and you're going to have 30 seconds for any loose ball technical foul. On the defense. On the defense, period. So we're talking about bushes, which is the most likely one. Yeah. Right. Uh, any kind of tech, well, yeah, technical could occur with a hold, I guess. It could occur, yeah. Yeah. It could occur with a hold or Anything. Any interference. Right. It's just a situation, well, yeah, with a loose ball that you would not normally throw the flag on. And that's, it's just. It's going to be something we're not used to. Like that's right. Guys into college. We're not used to throwing a flag on a loose ball. Right. Technically. Right. But in that situation, we're going to have to pull through it. Under... Right. And, and all it takes, really, you just blew the whistle. You just, as a crew, you just blew the whistle, right? You've killed it. Somebody on the crew has got to remember this. That's all it takes at that point. Somebody's got to go, isn't there some weird rule on the second? Front? You know, the, yes, yes, okay, that's a flag also, Coach. I'll remind you if it's again. But if it's not, you're not saying nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but so let's get back to the injury thing. So game management. So the, this technically you can leave a guy on the field injured. Technically, really, as long as if he's twisted his ankle in theory, let's just take a minor injury. You could leave him there until he rolls off the field and keep going until you know something. Technically. Or his mama shows up. Yeah. <laughs> and that's my point. That's my point. So at some point, guys, you know, game management steps in. So when, a sh when the advantage is kind of settled down, and, and, you know, and actually if the guy is down, it could be an advantage for a while. But as soon as that, for me, as soon as that ball kind of moves away from the goal a little bit, I blow it dead and I deal with it. Uh, also consider... You know, where that player is, is there an official with him? You know, if the official's back there with him, he's okay, he's talking, yeah, that, that helps. So it's a, it's really becomes a game management thing. So overall in your game management, be quicker on the whistle than not kind of thing. And then when it comes to the coach being mad at you that you just killed his fast break, coach, I did it because of safety. You have to. I mean, and especially if you don't know. If you don't know, you, you got you, the kid's safety becomes the most important. It's not good for anybody, but we got to be looking out for the injured player. Okay, so it's really a game. It becomes a game management thing. You don't want a kid suffering on the field any longer than he needs to be. So more of this, if one of my kids goes down, he better act like a soccer player. Yeah. And roll around. And until we give him a, a <laughs> un until we give him a penalty because he he. He flopped, basically. <laughs> okay, so all of these things are no whistle. Remember, don't, you're going to, I know I am, so I'm not, I don't mean to throw it in you. When that shot occurs, 
I'm ready to quickly blow that whistle dead. If it deflects off that goalie, deflects off a pipe, doesn't, it's some weak shot, you know, and it shoots and it rolls by and it doesn't go off the end line, you're still in play. Hold that whistle, choke it down. On um, two man, if you end up with a two man game, and we may have a couple of two man games this year, remember, especially old timers, we're running left. So you're on the far side of the field, you got the left end. Uh, you're on the near side, you got the left end this way. Different than what we learned coming up as young referees. The reason why is it aligns you for your face-offs just like you're do normally doing a face-off, okay, as a two-man. Just big picture, if you do end up in a two-man game, much wider, uh, the, the, the lead is down, goal line extended, covering everything, trail, remember you have over and back responsibilities, even though you have your goal, which is probably the most important thing, probably one of the hardest things to cover if you suck in too much, is that over and back call, getting yourself to that midfield line. Right, that's a tough one in two man. Um, I don't wanna go into too much more on that. There's a lot of slides on two man, and I just, I, we have maybe two or three games that way, so potentially, and they may go away, so. And I don't think that there's any games in Shreveport that are gonna be freshman JV or varsity that are gonna be two man anyway, so I think everything else we're gonna be doing up here is three man. So, so let's talk some positioning. We'll talk face-offs here in a little bit, um, but I just wanna talk some general positioning. Let's start with the ball down in this area, uh, and then we'll go into slow transition, fast transition. Okay, with lead, we want lead generally something foot, foot, or just below or just above on that goal line extended. He owns goal line extended until contentious play behind the goal. He moves down, covers the line or a shot. He covers the line and I'm gonna get to jogging, running, then resting. You don't walk on the field. Timeouts included, jog. Um, single, you guys are tied, right? Think of yourselves on a rope and trail. So as lead moves down or has to move out a little bit towards this corner for some reason, remember trail's got this sideline form so he doesn't have to worry about that sideline. Single has to definitely move in and move down to cover goal line extended until Lee gets himself back up to goal line extended. So I don't do it with conversation. When I get back there, if he's still there, I got it. You know, I'm on goal line extended. But make sure he's there. You don't necessarily have to verbalize it, but you do not leave it until he's, he's, he's got it. In and out. Ball starts moving, let's take it over here. Single side's got a lot of responsibility. He's back here in the corner, leads tight, here to the crease, maybe even slightly below helping him, but he's got goal line extended. Trail, there's no reason why you can't drift across the field a little bit. Just remember, you got this, this sideline. You own that sideline. So you can move in here and out. Everybody's moving this way, you're on that tether. You're moving in and out with them. Okay, any questions on that? Well, I don't know if I have some slot shot slides, but we'll talk lead trail on shooting. Uh, really, it comes down to what side the ball's moving in from, okay? We want to crash the crease. As the ball is moving towards the goal, we should be moving in with it, okay? Don't get so far in that you're right on top and you can't see anything, or you're blocking out the defender from the push that he's trying to do on the guy from behind, you know, that you're sucked up so tight to him. But be moving in and be in the position so you can see the call and then also sell that, make and sell that call, okay? You should not be out here, and there's a lot of videos out there where I see refs hanging out way out in here or up in here as the ball is transitioning. They're walking down the field and they're signaling a goal. The goal goes in, whistle, kill it. If you're not in on the crease, get yourself close to the crease. You're watching the players. Don't take your eyes off the players, you're not there. You're looking over at your partner, single or lead. Got a head nod, 
Got a frickin' deer in the headlights. You got a big wave off. Those are three different things, right? So you get the head nod, boom, goal's good. Get the ball, go do your face off, okay? Run to the face off circle and then, and then do a jog. So uh, if the lead gets pushed way out because the play is on this side. Yep. Down here. Sideline. Yeah. Single side want to take the goal. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. He can't. Obviously, he doesn't want to cross the center of the field. But he, 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 he probably. I challenge you. He should have his foot. Go put your foot in the crease. Then probably back up a little bit. But you should be that tight. I don't see a reason not. Unless you have a player. To say the ball's here and there's a player hanging here and you're in the passing lane or the passing lane. It, you know, you've got yourself so deep, the passing lanes behind you. Yeah. You don't. You want. You always want to keep the field in front of you, obviously. So when I say these things, keep in mind I want the field in front of me. I don't want to get sucked in so deep that now I'm doing. What happens when that ball passes behind me? You're a lighthouse. You're not an official. We don't want that. Okay. So let's just cover a little bit on transition. Oh wait. So the ball's moving this way. We'll just use from the lead side. What you typically will see and what uh, I brief in every R will probably handle it a little bit, but I think we've pretty much come to a consensus on this. When the ball's moving away, you got the hits, right? You're watching for the push or the hit in the back, the illegal body check, something on that's occurring on the back of the player as he's moving into the goal. This guy has the best view, typically, this is typically, of the, of the feet, right? He's watching across the goal. He's down there at probably the, no, no really higher than probably the crease at this point as they're crashing. Unless there's some player, you know, that's out here that's trying to get a pass, then you probably have to stay outside of him. And he sees the feet and a couple of things. So what are we watching for? We're watching for the shot to go off prior to him uh, and getting in the goal, prior to him touching the crease, the goalie, or the pipes. He's got a good view of that. The other thing he's got a really good view of, and usually the best view of, is somebody who leaves his, who's not grounded, who leaves the, field, uh, leaves the field, goes airborne on his own volition. How do you see that? You see the legs go. He's probably leaning pretty good, but you see those knees bend and he, they launch. Okay, so now you have a dive. Now, that doesn't kill anything, right? We have a dive, the ball, he's going up in the air. Now the question is, does he ever land in the crease? Touch the crease, touch the goalie, you know, touch a pipe. If he lands in the crease at that point, he should be waving off the goal, right? Big sell, big, big, and pointing. Lead, take time, manage your partner. You're gonna have the restart, but give single a chance maybe, maybe, but probably to start moving up field. Don't screw your partner over necessarily while he's stuck in there and has just made a great call for you to help things out. He's done the wave off point and he's running. He should be looking over his shoulder. Lead comes in, you know, make sure I got five yards, whistle start, okay? As on a slow, let's talk some positioning on slow clears. So the ball gets turned over this is now our trail, okay? Trail, single. Single, as you go to the cone, don't give up the field. What I mean by that, don't give up your perspective on the field. Run, look back over your shoulder as you're going so you can see where the ball is moving. Was it intercepted? Now something's happening right in front of your goal or right in front of your area. You need to be able to see that. So be looking over your shoulder as you get to the cone. So slow transition, you work your way up to the cone. While I'm at the cone, I'm kind of looking here. I got all three attackmen and defenders down there. So now I got to keep an eye on the six, right? The, the, the other guys, the other three and three as they do the cross so I can manage the count for offsides. Um, I'm just kind of keeping an eye, watching the ball come up. Trail, good position for you is behind the ball as it's moving up. Typically wide, unless it's way out here and it's contended play, then I would say suck in a little bit closer to the goal. Uh, but for the most part as you're coming out, because he'll help you eventually as it moves up, um, you're out here and you're tra trailing the play. Don't, 
get above the guys coming up the field. Stay equal or below them, and I'd recommend a little below them so you get full view of the field. If something happens, there's a quick turnover, you can cover your goal, okay? Work your way to this cone on a slow transition. The, the new lead, as he backs off, if it's a slow transition, I like him, I typically stay about two, two and a half lines at least ahead of the ball. So the ball's coming up. I come, my initial move is right into this area. Okay? And what I reason why I like here is I can watch substitutions as the ball's coming up and watch for anything going on in this area. Remember, this is the Bermuda Triangle. Any, you guys heard this term before? This is where it eats up referees. Now, all the stuff that happens in lacrosse that hurts referees usually happens right here or right around the goal. But the Bermuda Triangle, because you got your coaches here, both teams here, anything that happens in this area, you got substitutions, you got to move the ball in. I mean, everything can go wrong. So we want to keep eyes on that Bermuda Triangle. As the ball moves down, then he kind of starts positioning himself out here. Trail, trail, the trail coming up. Don't get ahead of the single and you move yourself to this cone, you can wait, let these two guys get, as the ball moves all the way in, he's got all the counts, right? He's got the 20 second on the time, he's counting the 10 seconds in, he's also doing his own little count if he can, and we're looking at sticks and the number of players for offsides. What do we count first for offsides, on a, especially a quick moving offsides, offense or defense? Who would you count first if you're making a count and you're not doing it in pairs? Offside, offside is going to end up in the stoppage play come back. Defense is only a play now. Right. So, uh, so the you count offense first. So you count offense first because of the whole, yeah, because you've got to stop play, turn the ball over, and you have the potential of a goal score that you might have to. That you, right, you can't score when you're offside. So get the call there. Okay, so he's back. He's here, the ball moves up, he's got his 10 second count coming in. These guys have a two man game right now. You know he's back here, but you don't know how involved he is necessarily with the coaches. And that's not your responsibility. But the over and back becomes a problem. So, you know, a good signal is, and for trail when you're coming up, is to watch for and acknowledge that the ball is touched in. This is a crew communication thing. Be watching enough that when they touch it in, single, keeping an eye across the field because he communicates with him on, typically on the field because they can see each other. Hey, you got it. If he doesn't, don't waste a whole lot of time watching him. Just know that he doesn't know that necessarily it's touched in. If the ball's moving around back here, he's probably got it. But if it's just kind of up in this area, he doesn't necessarily know and know that if the ball comes back in an over and back situation, you're going to have to help them out. Whatever the, they brief, yes, 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 over and back, pointing towards the goal that it is touched in, just you got to help him out. What his job here is, you deal with the coaches as you need to, and you're doing, you're doing a count. You're counting, you're watching substitutions that they're done correctly because you're right here on the cone. Nobody should be running into you. Um, you do a count of the players, count's good, and then I look for two short stick D men because that's easier than counting four long poles, either way. And then I move myself up. Little safety hat tip. You wanna to talk to the coaches or let the coaches talk to you? Stay close to the sideline here as you move up. Keep your eyes on the field. You want, the you want to hear the out the coaches, you wanna to talk to the coach about something, Eyes on the field, stay close here. They're giving you a rash of crap. You don't want to listen to the coaches. Just move yourself in a little bit. It's really simple. It really works for the most part. They'll, they'll get quiet as you move yourself into the field further. As, as everything's done with the substitutions, move yourself here. If they're, he's mouthing off at, at you, I'd hang out a little bit further on the field if you have to, okay? Just a little, a little thing that I learned just fairly recently because I'm always taking abuse from the sideline. And somebody said, why do, why do you sit there? Well, I don't know, because that's what I always learn. Move into the field, and it actually works. Okay. So these are all the positions that we cover. Oh, let me just go back on a fast, 
fast, fast break first. So on a fast break, when the things are moving really quick, you know, obviously he's got to get to his goal. And a little, how they show that bow there, is unless the ball is right with you and you're running with it, it's usually good to swing a little wide so you can open yourself up as you're racing in towards the goal and come at it, you know, like it's a, like a, like you're, like it's a curveball, you know, come into it. Because that way you can kind of stay open to the field. You got that goal, and then you got the shot and who gets to the end line first, too. All right? We run, lead, run. All right? Trail, jog. You can jog following up the play. Get into position, stop, rest. All right? If you're watching the play on a slow transition, I can see you backing down. That's okay. But we, we, we run as lead, we jog as trail, okay, getting into position when you're trailing the play. Single side, he probably doesn't have time to get to the cone. He's just getting down to help out lead best he can. As he's going, he, he, he has still the 20 second count, but that's probably already expired. 10 second count, he sees that he's going to clearly get in, but it's going. He's got the count. He's got to be looking for the, for the count as it's coming in and then to provide the support. And then the trail, he can just take his leisurely time, jog up to the cone, try to help out with the count and any offsides, and move on, okay? Um, restarts. I don't know that I, okay. So just restarts. Philosophies in general. Signals. We're communicating. One of the things that we found in our association that when we went through Laredo last year and in evaluations, we're really bad at signaling each other and communicating each other. So let's, he's, my, he's my single side. Bill Gallman and I are lead trail. I'm, I'm ball starting with Bill, and I'm, I'm getting myself in position. I'm running, and I'm probably going, hey, I'm ready enough. I got a position. If I haven't and I'm just hustling down, he probably needs to watch me a little bit until I get in the position and then I'm responsible for, yep, I'm ready to play. He realizes it to him and off we go. We should not be blowing through restarts. That's a long transition play, but on every restart, ball is on the end line, I'm down there on the end line, I should look at Dustin, he should have his hand down, I'm ready to go. I'm not really worried about Bill, we pretty much do a two-man game uh, around that in that kind of situation. But I want to see that is that he's he's ready to go. He could be talking to somebody. He could be distracted. I get a restart. Something happens over there. It's bad. So we want to get in the habit, and I want the R's all working with their crews to not uh, to work this problem that we're not blowing through stop signs and guys are giving the go signal. Okay, please, please help out with that. And that solves a lot of problems. You know, again, that's where we come alive. That's where we control the restart. Um, let's just talk about boundaries. A couple situations that, again, typically, in a single side, ultimately, I guess, has, can restart on his whole side. That's his sideline. But there are a couple of cases that I usually brief as are, and probably most do, as standard restarts for somebody else. So on a clear, balls, let's take the balls anywhere down in this area. <coughs> I prefer letting single get in the position and trail kind of moving over like we have here, even to or just below the ball and whistling it in. Same thing, lead is in position. I'm running, I'm signaling, I'm ready to, to bill and he's got the restart. And I have to single if the ball, especially if the ball's going out of bounds here, down in this area, he, doesn't, he can't tell when it's come in. So when it's come in, I drop my hand and we're ready to go. And think about this, guys. We want to put our hand direction in the direction that we're going. So if this is the situation here and we're transitioning to the right-hand side of the screen, when I signal that I'm ready, I'm not going to point this way, okay? We want to make sure that we signal in the direction that we're going. The only time you're going to have cross signals as far as where your hands are going to be is on a face-off. So if I'm the wing official here That's and I'm signaling, signaling that I'm ready, I'm going to point to the direction of the goal that I'm going to. If I'm the wing official here, I'm not going to point, all right, we're ready, okay? 
I'm covering this goal because I'm lead right as the wing official, so I'm here. Okay, so just kind of get in a habit of making those signals of we're transitioning this way, when I'm ready, we're this way. If we're transitioning that way, no stop signs running through, now we're ready, we're going that way, okay? One other restart area. So let's just have the ball more offensive. Trails here, leads down low, balls in the, down in the alley over here. So single side, in my eye brief, single, start, single side has, typically has the start down in this area. Why? Because lead, if he's down low on the restart, I'm stuck. I can't, I can't get into the goal, right? Because I got players out here. I can't get inside of them. He can. He can get in here and be sitting right on goal line extended. He has trail covering his sideline. So I usually brief single side start here. If you have it and you, it hasn't been discussed, they always, the thing is, hey, lead, I got it. I got it. And then he goes, nope. I got it, and then you move back up towards your cover and goal line extend it while he's going. Okay, just communication. I, that means I got it. Points to you for the restart, then you know you have it. Okay, big signals to each other. The other, the other one that we talked about already was, you know, anywhere kind of down here and that's zone one, zone four, the kind of the box areas, cross side. I prefer single to get in place on the cone. Okay, and let, let the trail whistle it in. All right, that's, that's it. Okay, here's some goal stuff around the goal. Okay, we've talked about lead, trail, I mean, going away from, into, who's got the call. But you look at this one, there's some communication going across between the referees, but a couple things. One, notice positioning, how wide everybody is. He doesn't crash the crease, he's not in close. He's not going to be able to really sell the call because he's not necessarily in the right position. But now, well after the play, he's signaling it's good. This could be done much, much better. With the two officials, as the guy's coming in the shoot, follow him in, much tighter in, looking across, is it good? Yep, boom, it's good, okay? Just a little bit quicker and a little bit tighter. Right here. All right, watch this. This is an example of a great one. So we'll watch it again. Watch him crash the crease. He's blocked out players right here, right? He's crashing the crease. He sees the guy get pushed down. He's in the crease, no goal, and then he gets ready for the restart. Again, on the restart, make sure nobody's within five. And if you can, give your, your buddy a little bit of a, run, a running start if you can, okay? If he's delaying or whatever, you know, get him moving. Great way to do it. Big sell, wipe off. Make sure when we wipe off a goal, though, you know for sure we're wiping off the goal. Or else go to the deer in the headlights, let's talk. While you talk, keep your eyes up on everybody else and what's going on between you. Okay, let's talk a little game management. And then we'll have some exercises. All right, so we've, we've talked about dealing with coaches and players. So uh, what I want you to do is, what are some of the things you hear from the sideline that drive you crazy, acceptable, unacceptable? Go, Bill. I'll start. Ow! Ow! Come on, that's a slice, that's a slice, that's a slice. Calls, making calls, anything else? You know, that's a ward. So we're you making. You gotta call. call that, ref. You gotta call that. What? Some more. Call it those ways. Yep. The game's gonna get out of control. <laughs> okay. Let it play. Protect my players. Gotta Let protect play. my players. Player safety. Okay. What are some really nasty ones? F bombs. Your, your, you know, what's wrong with your other referee? He sucks. You know, so, something like that. You gotta get control of this game. You gotta get control of this game. So. What, as you go through that, what you need to start thinking about is, and you've already done it, so you already know somebody's called, what's acceptable and what's not? So a couple of things that I, I do when I think about coaches. A comment, unless it's beyond my threshold, 
don't require any response. Silence is gold. Yeah, don't, don't engage. There's no reason. All, you hold all the power, right? So are you going to be for the good side or the dark side? You, know? you have all the power. Ultimately, you can eject that coach. You don't have to say a word other than, you know, unsportsmanlike conduct, a couple words. He's ejected. Well, one minute if you want to get rid of him. You know? So it's, it's that easy. So don't engage. Don't engage on comments. Sometimes there's times, and we'll talk about that. If it hits your threshold, then it's time to engage. I'll talk about the latter here in a little bit. But if you hear the F-bomb and everybody else can hear about it and they're losing it, then you got to do what you got to do, okay? You got you to hit them on it. But don't let the coaches distract you. And if they are, then talk to the head coach. Let them know this is not going to uh, continue. That call is awful. You're always going to hear that, 50% of the time probably, right? Because you got two teams. Our job, well actually, the, think of the teams. The teams are biased, right? The coach only cares about his team, his players. The other coach only cares about his team, his players. The fans, same thing. The only person on that field, the only three that are supposedly unbiased and fair are the three referees. You will never win um, the, the whole crowd. It's just not going to happen. So understand they're coming from those perspectives. They're seeing the game totally different than what you are. So when you do, we've talked about that in and out around the cones and being in front of the coaches. You want to talk to the coach, get close to him. Hey, coach, you know, and you, and you listen to him. Let him vent. It's good to let the coaches talk some. Right? The, that there's going on. I'll look for that. I didn't see that coach. I'll watch, 20, I'll watch for 21. I'll get the word out to my other officials. Boom. Acknowledged. I, I don't know what that call is. I'll, I'll check on it and I'll let you, I'll let you know or have him come, come tell you next time he comes through here. Um, he was great position. You know, I can't see it from here. That was, you know, he's in great position. So not selling a player out under the bus. There's tons of things to do, but keep your, keep your focus on the game. On this particular picture right here, I'm actually glad this came up because when I'm in a situation like this, my threshold is going to be higher because chances are likely that the coach is talking a little softer, maybe a little quieter than he would if you were yards apart, okay? So he may say some things that if he said this out loud for everybody to hear, he would get a flag. But if he says it just for me to hear, I'll allow him that opportunity to kind of vent. Just as long as he doesn't make it personal, like, you mother effer, if he calls me that. Or that's cheater. That's it, okay? yeah. but like I said, when, when, if you're in this situation and you're, you're back to the coach and you're facing the field and you let them kind of vent, your threshold needs to be risen as well. Just kind of keep that in mind. And remember, if you engage the coach, you, you, your threshold needs to go way up. Right? If you've gone after the coach for something, you've invited a response. Just know that. Now, there's, there's, there's limits to that, but you have instigated that conversation. And I would say, overall, our job as officials, what we should be striving to do, other than keeping the game safe and fair for the players, is de-escalating situations. Hard to do. You watch police officers, how they manage that. You know, they, they get a, a strong stance, but they, they don't lean in. They're not intimidating. Try to deflate situations. Listen, nod, acknowledge, and move on. Okay? You do not have to comment. I hear you, you know, acknowledge them, but you don't have to move on. I like to, if I like give a, a player a warning about, hey, you know, your stick's getting high, it's going to get, you're going to end up with something. I like to tell the coach that I gave the kid a warning. To That's good. Just so that he's like, that's a great idea. Guys. Great idea. Same thing with the face off guys. You know, coaches go crazy a lot of times in a close game on faceoffs that I'll, I'll tell, I'll, when I get a chance to swing by the bench, I try to get to an assistant coach and tell him why, what he's violating, what he's doing, what I'm seeing. Not only is it good to tell the coach that, but at the same time, you want to let the crew know that as well. Yes. Okay, so, you know, we all consistent, hey, I've warned this guy about his high, you know, his high cross, keep an eye out for it. Remember, this game is about the players. It's not about us at all. Treat them with respect. There'll be times they get disrespectful. Don't go down there. Remember, you have all the power. 
conduct. You don't have to get mean. And once you do a penalty on a coach or a, uh, a player like that, move away. There's no reason to stay engaged. You have done your, your <coughs> talking by what you have done. Now, when you report a penalty of a kid who just threw a real loud F-bomb by all the mothers, and the mothers are crying over there, you, you, when you do the call, you give an explanation to the coach, right? So it's not not giving an explanation. But now you're duking it out with the coach, and he does something, flag, unsportsmanlike conduct, whatever, one minute, non-releasable, white ball. You're done. Move away. Get away. And in some situations, like Brian has said, crew management, good game management, is probably a good time to maybe rotate him far away from that coach. Just what will probably happen is a goal score and will come right back, but you don't necessarily have to do that. But get some space. We're trying to de-escalate emotion, right, and keep the game going. So just remember the, the players, even though they're much younger, they're snotty-nosed and a lot of times teenagers and act it a lot of times, treat, still try to treat them with respect even when they're not doing you and when they get out of hand, punish them. Yep, find the captains, find the goalie. Typically play around the crease. The creaseman is getting a little carried away. I'll go talk to the player. I'll talk to the goalie. One technique that was given to me a couple years ago that I thought was fantastic. Great comment. I used to, as I was talking to a player, you know, going up the field if I was trail, I'd face him, right? And actually maybe even kind of impede him so that he would hear what I had to say and move on. What was recommended, and I've done a lot since, is if I'm in a trail or I'm running up close to that player who just held off on a slash or whatever, I just talk to him. I don't look at him. I talk to him about what the issue was or what went well, thank you, you know, kind of thing. But it becomes much less confrontational. And I'll even sometimes, if it's something a little more serious, I'll ask for an acknowledgement. Did you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, boom. And, but I don't... I don't face him down. It was quiet, just like he was saying. I can have a conversation with the coach very quietly between us. This conversation's been, I'm not selling out the kid. We're having a real quiet conversation as we're moving up the field. Yeah. What do you do about a, a goalie who gets frustrated and like, cusses at his own defense? I usually try to, unless the crowd can hear it. Right. That, so that's typically a goalie, keep it down. Yeah, I understand you're frustrated. Don't, don't, don't make me have to bang you for language. You can't, you, mo you got mom in the crowd. My mother's here. You know, something, try to lighten it up if you can, but yeah, I think that's appropriate. Yeah, I think I, I, think I give the goalie like more, than, more rope than a lot of other people. Well, and again, game management, what works for you, de-escalating situations. Don't be, what, what they say all the time in officiating is don't be that good. You, you know, to be a good official, you officiate beyond the rule book. But you can't do that unless you know what the rules say and how to work within the rule book. You know, so the, the room that this thing gives you, it's, it's not like football, you know, very cut and dry on a lot of calls. We, we have a lot of flexibility and it comes down to really the master's level of this sport really comes down to game management, managing coaches, managing a good game.